We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Oh, welcome back. Happy Monday to you. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you are uh, taking time out of your day to listen to the show. I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And if you happen to be watching it live on the YouTubes or the Periscope or Facebook, then I uh, want you to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share it with a friend. Let them know what you're watching and what you're enjoying because, frankly, that helps us out a lot. And if you'd like to follow me on any of the social medias or any of the stuff that I'm doing, just go to followjason.com. That's followjason.com, and i got all the stuff there that you could possibly want so that you never miss anything that I'm doing on any of the platforms. And so uh, what, I want to do something before we get started today. We're going to talk a little more on the, on the financial side. I always get really good responses when we talk about the economics and what's happening in the underlying economy, because I, I think it's something that not a lot of people talk about. It's something that doesn't get discussed nearly enough, and certainly not in a way that, that a layman could understand it. And that is, that, is not a, that is not a knock at the intelligence of this audience, because I happen to believe that we have the most well-informed and most intelligent audience uh, in, the, in America today, just simply because we take the time to educate. We take the time to break down the the information. And I always try and do it in a way that even, uh, I, the goal is 13 years old. If you're 13 years old and you listen to this show consistently, would you be able to understand the concept that I'm presenting? Because frankly, if you don't know anything about the stock market, if you don't know anything about economics and and all of the underlying, what some of this, even the terminology means, it goes way over your head. And it did me as well at the beginning. And so I want to take the time with you guys each and every day that we do this to come and have the discussion and do it in a way that hopefully leaves you empowered, understanding more so you can make better decisions. Because folks, we are the result of our past decisions. Whatever you have done yesterday, the day before, the day before, all throughout your life, you are the result of that. So if you look at where you are and you are like, I don't like where I am, well, then all you got to do is make different choices. What I don't want you to do is spend a lot of time looking backwards because, frankly, you're not going that way. There's no point in looking over your shoulder at your past decisions, your past mistakes, your past failures, because you are not going backwards. You're going forwards. So the goal is to take take where you want to be, that destination. What do you want your life to look like? And then to start making choices that build you into the person that is worthy of that life. You see, if, if you want to make a million dollars a year, which every one of you should want to do because a million dollars is not that much money anymore, and you want to make a million dollars a year, you must first decide to be someone who's worthy of making a million dollars a year because it can take new skills, isn't it? It's going to take, it's going to take, uh, it's going to take added risk for you to jump from the $60,000 or $70,000 a year job that you have today to the million dollars a year that you want to have. We got to develop a roadmap. We don't need to know every stage of that road, right? We, we might say oh, the goal is I want to make an ind- a million dollars a year and I only want to work eight months out of the year and I want to make a million bucks. Okay, that's where we want to end up. What about our life has to change in order for that to happen? Say, well, okay, I got I to gotta figure out, uh, I, I, need, I, need to, I need to design a business and, and get something up and running. Or I, need to, I need to develop this product and, I, and I'm going to need, uh, I need to like, like, three or four hours a week to do that. Okay. Well, that's a Sunday football game. Three hours a week is a Sunday football game. So what do you got to do? You got to give up the football game. You got to trade the football game for the life that you truly want. You got to build those skills. How are you going to build those skills? Well, I need an hour a week to work on my skill set. Well, what is that? Well, that's two real housewife episodes. Got to get rid of that. I want to get in better shape. 
I want to have that six pack back. I need to work out an hour a day. Oh my gosh, a whole hour? What does that mean? Well, it means I'm going to have to get rid of an hour of sleep. Instead of my normal 10 hours or eight hours, I'm going to get six. Because that's what it takes to become the person that I want to be, to be worthy of the life or the look that I want to have. And before, before I go too far, before we start the show today, I had a super chat at the end of last, uh, at the end of Friday's episode, and I didn't find out about it because I was just talking straight through and Matt didn't have a chance to interrupt me, uh, that kind of ties into this. And we were talking about this in the pre-show as well. So Matt, if you, can you read that super chat to me? So I, I, I get a clear head. Yeah. So, uh, this is from SEMO. He said, Hey Jason, I'm thinking about quitting my job because every time I get there, I get super depressed. I want to just be a creative and make things I want. How do I do that as quickly so I stop sucking? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, what I would tell you is, is you got to change the way you talk to yourself and about yourself. Okay? Well, how do I stop sucking? Well, stop telling yourself you suck every day. Okay? The fact is, is like, oh, I just want to quit my job and become a creative. Okay, what do you want to create? What, 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 what inspires you? I'm, I'm very creative myself. I love video production. I love, you know, coming up with short little skits and doing fun stuff. And I also really like money and love it. Have an addiction to it, as a matter of fact. I can't get enough of it. I love money. And so I, am, I like acquiring it. I like spending it on nice things. I like living a life that other people envy. I, that, I enjoy that. Won't apologize for it. So how do I meld my creativity with my desire for a life that other people really, really want? And so the way I did it was I channeled my creativity into marketing. I know I love teaching stuff to people and I coming up with creative ways to explain stuff. And so I do all of my creativity inside of my marketing that sells my products. Because you see, becoming a uh, becoming the next great director, becoming the next great actor or or whatever is there's about a you know a, almost zero chance of that ever happening for me. I do, I don't I don't possess all of the true talent necessary to do those things. But I do enjoy psychology and I do enjoy, um, I do enjoy uh, filmmaking. And so I kind of try and dovetail all of that together into, a, into an outlet where I can satisfy all of my desires. I decided a long time ago that I, I never wanted to do anything that I didn't want to do again. I remember the first time I told my mom that. And... I, she said something like I'm being very idealistic and that I needed to, you know, be more rational, that I had to have pay my bills and all this stuff. And I, I was just like, man, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to be rational. We, we talked yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, on Friday about being um, uh, un, un, uncompromising, right? To, to, we need a, a whole lot more, um, what was the term I used? Uh, uh, unreasonable people. I want to be unreasonable. Unreasonable people change the world. People who are unwilling to accept someone else's reality or the way things have always been or the way things are supposed to be done. Those are the people who change the world. Not people who follow the rules and do the right thing. Those are people who got good grades in high school, got good grades in college to get that good job making 60 grand a year. We're going to talk a little bit today about the wealth disparity that's happening in this country. The people who follow the rules lose. I don't want to be one of those people. So I remember talking to my mom, and I've talked to lots of people about it, and we've all, oh, well, you know what, that's a real, you're young, it's really idealistic. Boy, I'm so glad that I decided to set a goal of never having to do anything that I didn't want to do again. I've checked a lot of those things off the list. I don't mow my own yard. I travel first class. Haven't got to private yet. That one, we're working our way there, right? Never fly, never fly commercial airline again, right? Another one's don't drive myself anywhere. Have a chauffeur, somebody to drive me around. Why? Because drive, having somebody else drive me around is a lot funner than me driving myself around. I can get a lot more done. And so I Uber a lot of places now, but, uh, you know, eventually I think that the AI and cars is going to fix that problem for me, but I'm still working my way towards those things. I have a list. My life goals do not include the stuff I can buy or the stuff I can attain 
It includes how do I check this stuff off the list that I don't want to do anymore? Because that's the real joy. See, for me, work is about facilitating other things. I love my work. I absolutely wouldn't want to do anything different. I work all the time because a lot of it doesn't feel like work. But the fact is, is all this, all this money that we make and, and all, of this, uh, all of this autonomy that we create for ourselves is not so that the business can own us, it's so that we own the business. So the first thing that you have to do if you want to quit your job and work on stuff that, you're, that you think is creative is you got to first be more empowering in the questions that you ask yourself and in the way that you treat yourself. Your internal dialogue has a massive amount to do with both how you feel about the world about how you feel about yourself and about what you can accomplish in your life. So treat yourself better to start. I don't care. Lie to yourself. Oh, Jason, I don't know how to do that. Stop complaining. Stop crying. Just lie to yourself. What do you think the rest of us do? We lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves we're the greatest thing since sliced bread. When I started my podcast, I lied to myself and everybody else about how good the show was. The fact is, when we started this show, it sucked. It's amazing now. You would never want to miss an episode. But back then, it sucked. So what did I do? I said, I'm the number one libertarian host in America. The number one. By whose standard? By mine. I'm just going to declare it. Three years later, I was the number one libertarian host, not just in America, in the world. Okay? Lie to yourself. Keep working towards it. Act as if. If you want to become, you know, the next great fitness model in America, the next great fitness star, then act as if you are one. I, use, I always use smoking as an example for this. So imagine that you want to quit smoking. Very worst thing that you can do is say, I'm trying to quit smoking. I'm a smoker who's trying to quit because what are you? You're just a smoker. And it's just a matter of time before you go right back to smoking again. Best thing you can do if you want to stop smoking is to start referring to yourself as a non-smoker. When someone asks, offers you a cigarette, which they will likely do knowing that you smoke, you say, no, I don't smoke. They're going to say, what? Yes, you do. Nope. I used to smoke. I don't smoke anymore. I'm a non-smoker. Changes your whole world. Because the way you view yourself has changed. So... Talk better about yourself. Talk better to yourself. Be empowering in your communication. Lie to yourself until it's true. Second thing is, if you want to be a creative, I don't know what that means. Define it for me. What do you want out of this life? What do you want to create? Then we got to figure out who would want that or who would want some version of that. Because see, most of the time, if we talk about wanting to be a creative, we're not really talking about what we really want is we want, a, we want to do something that we love. So what is that thing? Like I said, I really love filmmaking and playing around with that stuff and learning about it. And I've got more camera equipment and more lighting equipment than I really need. But I have it because I love it. It's a passion of mine. I can't ever get enough of it. And so I try, I buy this stuff and then I try and find a way to use it to increase the value of what I produce. But here's the point I'm trying to make is that it's not the filmmaking that I love. It's the creativity that I love. And so I can do a lot of different things and still have that creative outlet. So I ask myself, what do I really love doing? And then I try and find a way to make money doing that. And it's not always the same thing. There's some guys, uh, there's, a, there's a group of you go to YouTube right now, which you're on, many of you are watching this show. Go there and just Google film, film Riot. Film Riot. It's a guy named Ryan Connolly started that. I think his name's Ryan. Uh, started that thing years and years and years ago. And when I first started getting interested in filmmaking, I watched all of his stuff. And what he is, is a guy who wanted to make movies. But see, making movies and getting people to fund your movies and all that stuff in the beginning is really hard. But he loves every aspect of it. He loves visual effects. He loves horror. He loves sci-fi. And so what he did was he started a channel on YouTube. And he started creating short films and started teaching people how to make movies. Stuff that he was learning how to do, he would film himself doing it and show the result of it and then teach people how to do it. And he started posting stuff online. Before you know it, he started building courses and all those special effects packs and stuff that you can buy that people who are interested in making film would want. 
developed a huge business out of it, a business that has allowed him to make films for a living. No, he's not making feature Hollywood blockbusters yet, but he gets to spend his life doing what he loves and he gets to be paid handsomely for it. So what do you really want? I understand you might hate your job right now. One of the ways that you can survive that and and get to a better place is again to lie to yourself. Wake up in the morning and say, I'm lucky to go to work today. I'm lucky to have this job. I'm lucky to have the opportunity to work this job that I don't really like so it can provide me the income that I need to chase the dream that I want to have. Be grateful. Changes your whole mindset. In the absence of that, all you're dealing with is is just waking up every day hating everything about your life. And I'm going to tell you right now, that'll spiral on you. That'll get control of you. That will drag you into a dark abyss from which you will never emerge. Can't have that. Not if you want to be successful. Not if you want to live a life of envy. Not if you want to live a life of abundance. No, you got to become somebody worthy of that life. Every one of you has the ability to get there. See, every, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Old Marine Corps term. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die. What does that mean? It means everybody wants the result, but they don't want to do what's necessary to get it. And so we have an entire industry, industries with an, you know, plural, that are built around telling you that you can do, you can get the result without the work. Every diet, every fitness piece of gizmo thing out there is going to promise you the same thing. Every opportunity seeker out there is constantly getting bombarded with people telling them, oh, I'm going to teach you this magic system to get all the leads you could ever want without spending a dime on marketing or advertising. Ain't going to work. 100% chance you're going to fail at that. So I don't sell my stuff that way. Because I don't want a bunch of people with me who don't understand what they're getting into. Those people are going to be disappointed. Those guys are going to ask for their money back because I'd have sold them a lie. If you want to go to heaven, you got to die. If you want a life that you've always dreamed of, if you want to get out of that job, to answer your question specifically, if you want to get out of that job, you got to become a person who can leave your job. That's where it starts. Everything else is just being willing to go the distance and take the risk. I realized really early on when I was in the contracting business that I didn't want to be in that business for long. I knew I was going to end up dead or at the very least spending my life um, you know, seeing my kids once, once every, you know, once, twice a year, because that's really what the job requires. And so I made a decision. I got to try and get out of this. What do I want to do? Well, I don't really know, but I think I'd probably want to work in, you know, the financial world somewhere. Cause I'm kind of interested in that. Don't know much about it, but I've always been interested in it. So I started on a path to become a person worthy of that life. You know how many years it took me? Four. Four years. You know, I got people who come to me and tell me, oh, Jason, I tried your thing for a solid eight hours today. I spent eight hours working on this and I couldn't get it to work. Well, holy smokes, eight whole hours? Well, then it's clearly not worth doing. I mean, if you can't get it done in eight hours, if you can't change your life in a weekend, then why even try? You know how stupid that sounds? But that's the expectation that we all have in our heads. Oh, what's the trick? What was the thing that made the difference? You know what the thing was that made the difference? Getting up every damn day and working like a rabid dog in the street, fighting like the last monkey on the third monkey on the ramp to Mother's Ark as the rain's coming down. Okay? That's what it took for years. Don't come to me. And complain because you can't change your life in six months? That ain't the way it works, folks. You gotta be hungry. And if you're not, then be satisfied with the life of mediocrity that you now have. You see, I'm I'm actually doing something right now 
that I'm about to teach in uh, that I uh, that people my my fo- the folks in my knowledge revolution course are learning this week, I believe. It's called polarization. I am I am eliminating everybody from this conversation who who wants quick and easy. They're all leaving. You want to, they don't want to listen to this message. They they're going to go find somebody who's going to tell them what they want to hear. You know what's great about that? Is now I can have honest and frank conversation with the rest of you. Because if you're nodding your head going, that's right Jason, that's right, you're my people. You're who I want. I don't want that other guy who says, "How dare you, Jason?" How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you make this seem like it's my fault? It is your fault. Whose other other fault is it? If you are a result of every decision that you have made up until this point and you're not happy with where you are, whose fault is it? Oh, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to be called on the carpet and be told directly to their face what they know to be true but yet they deny. If you are spending your life blaming other people for where you are, let me tell you something, folks, you're never going to have the life you want. And not only that, you're going to be miserable in the life that you have. Because a, a man who blames other people for where he's at is a man who believes he has no control over his life or his destiny. He's a slave to someone somewhere. Yeah? So again, let me wrap up this, uh, this question. If you guys want to send us these questions, we love taking your money and you, we will absolutely bump you. I told you I have the, you know, this, this rabid addiction to, you know, making as much money as I can. So I will answer any question that you guys throw out there, uh, you know, for a super chat on, on YouTube. But my point is this is like, how do I quit my job and just work on things that I want to work on? You change your mindset. And you change your life so that you can become the person who gets to have that life. Now, the specifics of that, of the step-by-step process that you need to go through, is unique for, uh, for depending on what it is that you're trying to do. So I want to start a photography business. Okay. Well, now we have to decide what kind of photography, and there's all kinds of other questions that we look at and kind of narrowing down what you want to do and who you want to be develop a brand, start doing some, you know, some content marketing, all the stuff that I teach people to do in the old knowledge revolution program. Okay. The other big mistake is thinking that you're somehow different than everybody else. You're not. Everybody likes to be told they're different and special. We got entire generations of kids who believe that about themselves. It ain't true. Okay. I'm nothing special. There's nothing, there's nothing that I've done in my life that I don't think any person could do if they just were willing to devote the time, effort, and energy required. Just most people won't. Yeah, they, they, can't, they can't start if they don't have a guarantee at the end. Why do you think people put guarantees at the end of their products? Why do you think that is? Okay. Do you think if I made less money by offering a guarantee that I would still do it? No. It's to get all of those people who just won't move, won't do anything to help themselves unless there's a guarantee at the end of it to move and make a decision. It's a risk eliminator. But here's what I really want to say at the end of every one of these. Well, okay, what about the guarantee? Well, here's a guarantee. I've been doing this 10 years now without a guarantee. Without, I've been playing without a safety net, boys. The fact is there is no guarantee. And if you want one, you might as well just quit now. If that's you... And you got to have a guarantee. Well, then don't even sign up because I don't want you in the program. And sometimes we do so like that. The only reason anyone offers a guarantee is because every time you test it, guys make more money at the end of the day from the guarantee than without it. Like, whoa, if you if you got a quality product, you'll have a guarantee. No, people sell garbage all the time with a guarantee. And you know what? People buy it. A portion of them refund because it's a garbage product. The other people don't. And at the end of the day, when you tally all the numbers up, you make more money with a guarantee without it. That's the only reason anybody offers you one. So the next time somebody tells you about a guarantee or God forbid, they come out and say, yeah, we don't have a guarantee. If you need a guarantee, don't buy. Oh, well, if you were an honest person, you'd offer a guarantee. Actually, no, I'm slitting my own throat in one way by not having one. 
But you know what it does when you don't offer a guarantee? You only get people who don't care about the guarantee. You actually get a group of people who are more likely to succeed than not. Because they don't come into it looking for the way out. Because if anybody's been listening to me for any length of time, it's not a question of whether or not you trust me or whether or not I can do it. Because I've demonstrated time and time again that I can. And that I can teach others to do it. At the end of the day, what we're really afraid of, what you're really saying when you say, ah, how will I know this is going to work for me? What you're really saying is, I don't trust myself enough to buy into this program. I don't trust myself enough to do what you tell me to do. And there's, there's nothing I can say to you to fix that. Until you trust yourself enough to do what is required, and until you believe in yourself enough to do what is necessary, there's no chance of your success. The dirty little secret is your success has less to do with me and more to do with you. I have knowledge and information. I have years of experience. I know how to save you a lot of time and a lot of money by doing it my way instead of somebody else's way. But I can't make you do the work. You know? You know how many times I go onto these sites and, uh, and see people who are having discussions? They're like, hey, I need an accountability partner. Really? You need somebody to hold you accountable to doing the work to make your dreams come true. Quit now. That's what I want to say. Just quit. If you require some stranger on the internet to be your accountability buddy, you're already done. Go home. It, I, I know this is terribly polarizing when I talk like this, but you know what? It's how I really feel. And not only that, it's true. Don't like it? You know, there's the door. Walk, go, run. You can hit X anytime you want to. You won't got to listen to me. You can stop playing this message right now and go listen to somebody who'll tell you exactly what you want, who'll fill you full of sunshine and rainbows. Oh, Lord, you can do it. You're the champion. You're the best. What you're saying is so important, and you need to get your message out to the world. How many times have we heard that garbage? Well, what you need to do is find value in excess of what you want to charge and then spend the rest of your time learning how to find people who are interested in that and doing everything you can to deliver the promise to them. That's what we do, no matter what your business is, no matter where you're at. You want to get out of the situation you're in now? Make different choices. Ask yourself, what does the person who's living the life I want to live, what does he know? How does he think? If any of you look at me and the success that I have had, modest as it might be, and said, dude, I would really love it if I had total autonomy over my life and I could just go and do stuff that only stuff that I was interested in like Jason. And you want to know what a guy like, like me thinks about and how I think? All you got to do is listen to this show. That's it. Listen to this show and I will tell you exactly how to think. Not what to think, but how to think. But I hope that answers your question. That was a 28-minute response to your question. So I, I know you got your money's worth. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, Matt, what do you got for me? Yeah, give me I was a chance to say you you love your uh you love money. You're not ashamed of that. Yeah. So you want people to give you money, but you're going to give people their money's worth in return. Well, yeah, of course, yeah. It's like and that's and that's the funny thing is like we're we're not talking about um we're not talking about you know taking 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 from people. We're talking about providing, you know, true value to folks uh, in exchange for what they have and value is always a funny thing. I'm not going to rehash this today, but value is terribly subjective. You know, somebody finds value in things that you may not find any value in. It doesn't matter. You're not the one spending the money. Okay? It, that's, that's the whole point. So you need to figure out what they value and then give it to them, whether or not you think it's valuable or not. So anyway, let me tell you about our, our sponsors for today, and then we're going to move on. I got into my bed last night and just put fresh sheets on the bed. I crawled in and I, I literally made this noise. 
<laughs> that was the noise I made. Yeah. Now, some of you are wondering, no, that's not, that's not that noise. It's the noise of being completely like just feeling so amazing. You know, when you crawl into those clean sheets on a, this, on a amazing mattress, right? Just the, it just is perfect. Everything's perfect. Got your bowl and branch sheets, got your Helix mattress. I got to tell you guys, some of you have not had that feeling in a long time. And it's because you're dealing with a mattress that's like 20 years old that you got from your parents when you got your first place and you're still on that mattress. Either that, or you've been living on that mattress for 20 years, 15, 20 years, keep flipping it over and you have forgotten what a truly great night's sleep is like. That's why I want you to go to helix, uh, uh, helixsleep.com slash Stapleton. And I want you to take their two minute sleep quiz and they're going to match you with a customized mattress that will give you the best night's sleep of your life. And I took that sweet sleep quiz. I have, uh, they matched me to the Helix and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux. They wrote that in the copy. I'm assuming that that's which one it was, but I actually don't know for sure. <laughs> so I got a really nice mattress from Helix last time I went there to buy one. Um, it's a soft mattress designed for side sleepers and it's perfect for me, which th that is all true. So they must've done, my, they must've done their research on me. <laughs> so I have a really great mattress from them. They have a 10 year warranty and, and you get to try it out for a hundred nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. So right now Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Stapleton. Go to helixsleep.com slash Stapleton for up to $200 off your mattress order. Absolutely love these guys. Cannot say enough about them. Matt owns one of their mattresses. I have family who owns their mattresses. It is I, I rave about them. They're phenomenal. And they're going to be a lot cheaper than you think they're going to be. I remember my mom, I sent her there. She said, what kind of mattress do you have? I said, a Helix Sleep mattress. She went on there and checked it out. She's like, I was really surprised at how reasonable the mattresses are. I said, not only are they reasonably priced, I said, they're amazing. They are, they are the definition, Helix is, of providing value in excess of what they charge. Absolutely the epitome of it. So go and check them out, helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton. Second one we got here is Lightstream. Guys, are you paying more money in interest than you need on your credit cards? Refinancing your debt today with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. Roll all your balances of, uh, of your credit cards onto a single monthly loan payment with rates as low as 5.95% with auto pay. That's really phenomenal, guys. Credit cards charging you 20, 25, 24%, whatever it is. Uh, these guys under 6%, um, you know, and, and plus there, uh, absolutely no fees involved with this application is quick and easy online. If you have gotten yourself into a bad way, especially with all the stuff that's going on right now in our economy and, but you're coming out of it, but now you're facing a lot of this debt and you're worried about it, or let's say you had the debt before and now things are looking even worse, one of the easiest things that you can do is consolidate that and pay a lot lower interest rate. You're going to pay that down so much quicker uh, by having a lower interest rate. So don't make the mistake that a lot of people do uh, of paying off all these credit cards uh, at, at really high interest rates. Now, here's the trick. This is the one caveat I will make to you. You cannot consolidate your loans and then continue to put money on the credit cards. All you're doing is just creating a bigger problem. But if you're in a position where you're like, look, I'm, I'm starting to feel underwater with all this. I need to get these credit cards paid down. Uh, don't do it at 24% or 19% or whatever it is. And get those things consolidated. Pay, pay a smaller uh, interest rate on the money that you owe so that you can come out on top. Apply today to get special interest rate discount and save even more. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Stapleton. That's L-I-G-H-T. S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Stapleton. Your subject to credit approval rates uh, include a 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers a subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Stapleton for more information. All right, Matt. Uh, I guess I'll throw it to you, buddy. What do you got? Well, I think that we have got... Do we have any uh, more... good setup super, for... What's that? Do we have any more super chats? No, we don't. He said he was he was thankful. He he said you answered his questions. Okay. He was he was happy with what you said. Perfect. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's Thanks. take a look at what's happening with the wealth inequality in America today. And I know what we took a long time to get here, um, but I this is important for you guys. And I'm going to do my best to explain this in a way that is going to, as I said, is going to make sense for everybody. I'm going to start from this zero hedge article. Entitled, this is written by Lance Roberts of realinvestmentadvice.com. It's the Federal Reserve 
and its ongoing destruction of the bottom 90%. There are a ton of people out there who believe that the wealth inequality is caused by the rich hoarding money and the rules being set up uh, to keep poor people down. And, uh, and therefore, the answer to this question, uh, the, the answer, the solution to the problem, excuse me, the solution to the problem is to punish wealthy people because they somehow received their ill-gotten gains through nefarious means. Now, they have part of this right. The truth is the system is set up to benefit wealthy people. Uh, and the worst thing that you can do is to give the group that has created that problem more power. See, people don't realize that the reason that the game is rigged and it's set up for ultra wealthy people, very wealthy people to get ahead while everyone else struggles and, and takes the brunt of the burden and ends up paying for the debts and the problems that these very wealthy individuals and corporations create. Uh, the reason that that happened and the game is rigged that way is because government rigged it that way. And I've never understood this concept that says, okay, we know our government is corrupt. It's corrupted by these, by these corporatists who come in and want to create an unlevel playing field that benefits them at the expense of everyone else. We know that this is true. Why do we give the government more power? Why do, we, why do we go to them and say, well, we need new regulation. We need new bills. We need you know, new ways to punish. Because that's what your politician is going to pitch to you. They will literally, on the one hand be screwing you over through the legislation that they pass, and they will, on the other hand, be telling you that we have to pass this legislation to protect you. Don't, I don't get it. But here's what happens when you do and you take the kind of positions that our government has and our, our Federal uh, Reserve Bank has done for many, many years. Let me read. This, uh, the one lesson that we have clearly learned since the 2008 great financial crisis is that monetary and fiscal policy interventions do not lead to increased levels of economic wealth and prosperity. All of this intervention, all this money printing, all of this, you know, the Federal Reserve coming in to prop lower interest rates, we know this doesn't create wealth or prosperity. Okay. While we will address the, uh, the, the statistical data, there is also anecdotal evidence which supports this thesis. Since 2008, there have been rising calls for socialist policies such as universal basic income, increased social welfare, and even a two-time candidate for president who is a self-admitted socialist. Uh, such, things wouldn't even, uh, such things would not occur if prosperity was flourishing within the economy. So what he's essentially saying here is like the fact that Bernie Sanders has a voice and that he's able to run for president twice is evidence that whatever we're doing now is not working. It says, take a look at the chart above. Yeah, 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 I'll read it to you. Companies derive their revenue from the consumption of goods, products, and services they produce. There is a logical stock price appreciation over the long term has, uh, has roughly equated to economic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase this. Uh, so it's, it's, it's logical for stock price appreciation to roughly equate to economic growth. However, that relationship has been unhinged since the financial crisis due to the Fed's intervention and suppressed interest rates. So what he's saying in layman's terms is, look, if the, if the stock market is going up and companies are making more money and those companies make their money because it is being derived from the consumption of the goods, products, and services that they produced, then you should likely see an increase in, uh, in the amount of economic growth that we see in the economy. So we, we should be seeing everybody kind of raised up by this. So, but that's not what's been happening. From January 1st, 2009 through the end of March, the stock market has risen by an astonishing 159% or roughly 14% annualized. With such a large gain in the financial markets, there should be a commensurate growth in the economy. After three massive reserve-driven quantitative easing programs, a maturity extension program, bailouts of TARP, TGLP, TGLF, etc., uh, HAMP, HARP loans, direct bailouts to Bear Stearns, AIG, GM, uh, bank supports, etc., all of which totaled more than $33 trillion, accumulative real estate growth was just 5.48%. See, we're seeing growth in the stock market, seeing those 
people who own stocks or who own the companies, these stocks, we've seen them make a lot of money. Nobody else is seeing big increases in the value of what they've got. While monetary intervention are supposed to be supporting economic growth through increase in consumer confidence, the outcome has been quite different. Low to zero interest rates have incentivized non-productive debt to exacerbate the wealth gap. The massive increase in debt is actually hampered growth by deviating uh, by diverting consumptive spending to debt service. So let me explain what that means. He says low to zero interest rates have incentivized non-productive debt to exacerbate the wealth gap. What is non-productive debt? Uh, it's what Apple did. Issues $80 billion in, in, uh, in loans, in bonds, which is essentially a loan, $80 billion so they could buy back their own stock to increase their share value. That's, a non, that's non-productive debt. All that does is line the pockets of Apple shareholders at a very low interest rate has absolutely nothing to do with creating more productivity, more research and development, more hiring, any of that stuff. It's just, it's literally debt that was created for no other reason than to enrich the shareholders. Okay. And the massive increase in debt has actually harmed growth by uh, diverting consumption spending to debt service. What does that mean? It means people are borrowing, 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 and now they're having to pay back all of the debt that they've accumulated and they have reduced spending in the future. So if I borrow a hundred dollars at a 10% interest rate, uh, a year later, I owe $110. That means I have, that's an extra $10 that I have to pay back that I can't spend on more consumption or more savings or more product productive use. It's money that just goes to pay debt service, which reduces the amount of consumption. This happens at the, at the federal level as well. If you don't think that all of that debt that we've amassed and all the interest we have to pay on that debt hampers productivity and hampers growth, you're lying to yourself. It's an impossibility. It can't not hurt our ability. Think of all of the programs that that we could be investing in if we didn't have to pay trillions of dollars in debt service every year. I mean, really. But because we wanted it now, 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 because we had to spend a trillion dollars or four trillion dollars or whatever it is, two trillion dollars most recently, to save the economy. Now we've created two trillion dollars of new debt that we're going to have to pay interest on. It's a huge problem, massive problem. If wages don't rise at a pace fast enough to offset the cost of uh, maintaining the standard of living, individuals are forced to turn to debt and credit to fill the gap. The lack of savings was recent was a recent topic of a discussion on the Wall Street Journal. Roughly half of U.S. households have no emergency savings, according to the Federal Reserve survey released last year. Why do you think that is? It's because we glorify, glorify spending. The more crap you have, the more valuable, the more successful you appear to be. We glorify it. People spend every penny. They don't save. Not to mention the fact that now you're seeing inflation, cost inflations rise quicker than wage inflation. So there's a disparity. And what does a family, low-income family, middle-income family do? They end up turning to credit cards to cover the gap. To get over the hard times. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. You know, this this whole system like this that's built this way isn't an accident. This glorification of spending and this... this um, emphasis on living off of debt. It's not an accident because well, one of the greatest realizations for me in understanding how the economy gets skewed and how we get this, this um, stretching of the middle class to where the lower class and the upper class are becoming separated from one another was when I realized that when this new money gets pumped into the economy, um, like Branky would call it helicopter money, but it isn't true helicopter money where it's just being money that's just randomly distributed throughout the country. If that was the case, then um, the the deviation, the, the, the difference between the rich and the poor wouldn't be so sharply deviated. If the money, if it was true, if you took all of that money and instead of the $2 trillion going largely to other, to major companies, to major banks and stuff, if you just took that and did it in direct payments to everyone, then, and everybody got all of the new money at the same time, you wouldn't get the sharp disparity in wealth inequality, but you would get much faster inflation. Because all of that money suddenly is going to start circulating through the economy really fast because the majority of people spend their money more than they save it. So this 
the the people who are closest to the Fed. So starting with the local banks and then with the with the banks that are local to the Fed and then gradually um, uh, spreading out from there. Those are the people who benefit from the new money first. So when new money goes to this the bank, the bank gets to benefit from the purchase the the on uh, the the um purchasing power of that new money before the rest of the economy realizes that there's new money there so they get increased purchase purchasing power out of those new dollars and then as you gradually get further and further away from the fed that purchasing power fades away until they get a new injection of money and this creates the haves and the have nots the people who are tightly closely associated with the bankers they get their they get the money first they get the additional purchasing power and everyone else has to wait and this isn't an accident and I think I think some of it has been well intentioned from some people who think this is just necessary to keep the economy going. They're not just you know they're not the the rich guy with the monocle twirling his mustache like wah ha 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 ha. They're just like well if we just start dispersing money out to everybody, we're going to have runaway inflation, which is true. They will. The way to control that inflation is to control how how the money gets dispersed. But what we've created is basically almost like a closed system among the elites where money is loaned is loaned out to companies and those companies buy their own stock with it. And all of the money remains up within like the, the, the ruling elites. It's just being traded around among them. And every once in a while they'll start, someone will start a company and they'll hire people on and that money will trickle down to use the trickle down term. It'll trickle down to the lower, to the, you know, the plebs who are out, outside the city walls, you know, they're, they're getting their money out there. But this is this is the mechanism that has created this big disparity. Yeah, and, and, and I don't I don't want anybody to misunderstand. Like, there's nothing wrong with Apple. By Apple is doing what is logical given given the incentives that it's been provided. Correct. If you That's were the, sitting on incentive. yeah, if you're sitting on massive amounts of cash, and all of a sudden somebody says, "Well, hey, you can borrow a ton of money up for basically nothing, and you can pay it back over time with essentially no interest." And you can use that money to buy your shares back and increase the value of your stock and line the pockets of every one of your shareholders, thus incentivizing more people to invest in your company. Okay, why not? You're obviously running a very good business. You obviously are really good at managing your cash flow and, and doing, what you, doing what you do best. So why would you not do that? You see, these are the unintended consequences that low interest rate environments create and all of the bubbles and, and all of the, uh, I, I, I guess, um, um, confusion it creates, disparities it creates in the market is that the government and the central bank tries to do something good, but as is typically the case, they end up creating a bigger problem that'll have to be happened down, that'll have to be fixed down the road. And the problem with this is, is that none of those guys will be around when that problem occurs. See, all the bad decisions that Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen made when they were running the Fed, they didn't have to eat any of that. When Alan Greenspan kept uh, interest rates artificially low for decades as, and everybody was lauding him for it, he knew, he's not an idiot, he knew what it was going to result in, but he was going to be long gone by the time that happened, and then he'd just get to critique everybody else. See, these guys have short-term time horizons. Because they only care about what happens when they're in office and when they're running things. Once they're out, as long as they've taken that time to line their own pockets, which they all do, then they don't care. So why would you give these folks any more power or authority? Yeah? Correct. Yep. And this is, this is not, it, this is, what we're describing is the specific function of the existing system that we have. But every system, this is a fundamental thing about human nature, every single system will operate in some sense like this, where the haves will benefit more from whatever the system is than the have nots. It's just the nature of how human beings arrange themselves. You can call it the um, the, the Pareto principle or whatever, the 80-20 law. This is the way that every single arrangement of human beings will naturally come. You can't create a system that isn't going to have this dynamic to it to some extent, where the, the elites have all of the money and the, and the plebs don't. So this is why this, the key to a healthy society is for you to go from a pleb to an elite most easily to have to have clear um, mobility between the two thresholds. That is a critically important point that you just made, Matt, is that this is the, the, the question becomes when we start talking about this, people end up saying, well, OK, Jason, what sort of system should we have that prevents this? You won't. You can't create a system that prevents this. This will always occur. Because so the, the system will be created by people. Correct. That's right. And so what we have to do is the the, the goal is not. Uh, is not the difference between the very poorest and the very wealthiest. What matters is mobility. 
How easy is it to go from one of the poorest to one of the wealthiest? How many impediments have been created that, that make it difficult for you to move from someone who's making a, a middle income, middle wage job to somebody who is truly has a life of abundance? And the problem with all of the things that the government does, every bit of regulation, every bit of oversight, all the taxation, all of that creates impediment to moving from one layer to another. See, the government can never make it easier to get rich. They can only make it harder to correct. get rich. And so the, the goal for all of us should be mobility of wealth, not, not the, the wealth disparity between the poorest and the wealthiest. Because the fact is, is that they were, if there were a huge wealth disparity in America, wealth inequality was 10 times as wide as it is now. But it was, it was relatively easy for someone to get out of poverty and become part of the top 10%. Then would anybody care? Like, oh yeah, he grew up poor, but there's a pretty good chance he's going to get out of poverty. It's, it's, if he wants to, he can, he can get out. It's not difficult. It's just, you know, he can have a, a life that's much better than the one he has now. It will always be difficult to be in the top 1%. Always. Well, you want to know how I know? Because only 1% of the people get there. Okay? So it's always going to be difficult to do that. The importance is, is how easy is it for you to move in and out? And more importantly, how much ownership do you have in the success or failure of what you do? And here's the real issue that people have with wealth disparity and wealth inequality in America and around the world. Do you notice that nobody's really upset that, you know, Brad Pitt makes $20 million a picture? Like nobody really cares. They just like that. The Rock made $67 million last year. Anybody looking at The Rock and is angry at him for making all that money? No, the guy's a great guy. He owns his own tequila company now or whatever, and he's making pictures. He's one of the hardest working dudes you'll ever meet. Nobody's angry at him. Why do you think that is? They think he earned it. Well, not just that they earned it. It's not just that. It's that he could lose it any day. Okay. He, he, could, he could actually go bankrupt like all the rest of us. We, we see it time and time again. Actors like, take Nicolas Cage. The guy's made $100 million, $200 million over the course of his, his lifetime. He's flat broke all the time because he buys the stupidest stuff imaginable. He owns like a yacht and a jet and like 18 houses. And then all of a sudden he hits a dry patch and you know he's, he's flat broke and hasn't paid his taxes. When we see wealthy people who have to take responsibility for their failures, we, we don't mind wealth. We aspire to it. We love the idea of having it. We relish the idea. The problem is when we know that when we feel like they can't lose it. And that's why there's so much hatred for people on Wall Street, for big corporations, <coughs> excuse me, who seem to have a lock on their wealth. See, they, they can make all kinds of bad decisions. And then when it comes time to pay for those bad decisions, the government steps in and protects them and shelters them. This is where you get the 99%. What's that? There's a term for that. They're rent seekers. These are what they're, they're people. This is um, uh, Nassim Taleb wrote his book, the Skin in the Game, was entirely yep. about this concept. The people that are, that are um, bureaucrats, they're in academia, they're in government, they're in um, major corporations, they're lobbyists. They're people who, who they earn what they, they get off of the backs. They take advantage of the system. They take advantage of other people. And they don't, there isn't a clear path to them losing out on it. This was something I actually posted on, on Twitter uh, this week, I said, I said, here's the thing about rich people. They got that way because they know how to work the system by definition. And because they know how to work the system, they know how to offload their losses onto people who don't. So every policy directed at sticking them with the bill, no matter how well intentioned will ultimately hurt poor people. Mm -hmm. If you're rich, if you're wealthy, if you're powerful, then you have the resources and the know-how to avoid. It's like, it's like there's like incoming bullets coming at you and you're like, like, um, uh, Neo in the matrix, you know how to avoid and dodge all the bullets. So those bullets are going to hit someone else. You're going to redirect them. They're going to miss you. So if you're rich and wealthy and powerful, that's how you are. So if you try to, if you try to shoot and hit the, the rich, wealthy, powerful person, you're just going to, it's going to deflect off of them and hit someone else who didn't deserve it. And this is why every major, like the, the communist revolution and the French revolution, all these revolutions wound up being, um, where the, like the middle management of society, the, the landowners, the, the, um, farmers, the people who, they're not, they're not the rich of the rich, but they're just wealthier. They're like kind of the middle class. They got genocided because the, 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 when the masses rise up and revolt, they can't actually get to the major power brokers because major, major power brokers are insulated. So the major power brokers push out the next, the next, uh, 
tier down the the people who are who are like maybe like the five or ten percenters they push them out as sacrifices here take them out and those are the people who get wiped out you'll never actually get to the major power brokers yeah and and, and you're exactly right is uh, so my point with all of this is just simply the wealth inequality that we're seeing today is not a result of uh, of uh, of some sort of crony, cap well, there is a portion of it is crony capitalism. But what I'm getting at is, it's not because the wealthy people in this country are evil. It's the fact that you have a small handful of people who have organized the the way our our our, our economic system works to benefit, always benefit and protect those who have the most money. And so what I want you to take away from this is pretty simple: is that the you get out of the bottom ninety percent. I'm not telling you you got to be a multi-gazillionaire. That's not what I'm saying. Because frankly, getting into the top 1%, only 1% 1 of people will do that. That's why they're the 1%. Okay? But being, being better than 90% of people is something that I think everybody can do. And here's why. Because it doesn't take much. Most people are incredibly mediocre. Most people do an incredibly half-assed job at pretty much everything in life. Okay? Very few people have hunger or drive or ambition. All you got to do is be better than somebody who's mediocre and you already beat out 90% of people out there. And so I think every one of you has the ability to be part of the top 1%, I'm sorry, the top 10%. And the top 10% in America, Matt, you can look up the most, real, uh, most uh, recent number, but I believe it's somewhere around $150,000 a year. For the which, the top 10%? Yeah, top 10%, 150 grand. It depends on what state you're in. But I mean, a, a blended portfolio of 10 percenters is probably around 150 a year. Might be less, might be 86. I can't remember. 120. 120. Okay. 120 grand a year, $10,000 a month, you're a top 10 percenter. We got to come up with something like that. We have the 10K club in, uh, in my group, in our, our private network, the nine figure network. We have a private, uh, we have a, a badge for the people who hit the 10K club. And we consider that to be the the mark where you transition from part time hustler to full time entrepreneur is that a hey, you you've you've bridged that gap you're now part of the top ten percent and so as as you are trying to organize your life if you want to be part of the top one percent I'm not trying to talk you out of it I'm just saying let's start with making you part of the top ten percent because once you do that all the rules are set up to help you. See, all the rules, all the tax laws, everything that's been created are designed to help companies and entrepreneurs, people who invest and people who create. And what I'm telling you based on this article and based on the facts as they are today is that your odds on getting rich and creating autonomy in your life and creating security in your life by working for someone else is almost zero because your income is not growing at, to, at the rate of inflation. I'll, I'll read this last bit of the article to you. It says, incomes for all the highest income Americans have been stagnant or falling for decades. Median household incomes in 2018 was only 3% higher than in 2000. Tw almost 18 years and only a 3% growth rate in median household income. Adjusted for after adjusted for inflation, according to the census, for the poorest twenty percent, incomes had declined by two percent. So if you're in the bottom twenty percent, you're getting more poor as time goes by. And if you're in the middle class, you basically stay in stagnant. If you're an employee, you're basically not making any headway at all. Okay. Now we can always tear into these numbers and find uh, you know recast it to pre to present a different view. What I'm getting at is this. Um, Stop being poor. Stop having that mindset. Recognize that you put your family and you put yourself at risk by choosing not to take risks. You know, and the fact is, is that you're not going to get ahead because they haven't given you the ability to get ahead. It's no law. It's not, it's not really an option for you anymore. Because the way the Federal Reserve and our government has stepped in time and time again to alleviate crises and shift the blame and shift the buck from the companies that created these problems uh, to you prevents you from ever getting ahead unless you take control of your own destiny in your own life. Okay. 
Somebody said, uh, I'm not, I'm not so sure if that's the case, then every military officer and senior government employee is in that top 10%. Yeah. Numbers don't lie. I, 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 a lot of people see, that's the problem is a lot of people think that if you're in the top 10%, you got to be like a multimillionaire. Oh, no, 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 you don't. You got to make like 10,000 bucks a month. That's it. You, you're top 10 percenter. Now, when I say that to you, do you have a top 10 percenter mindset? I've always said, if you want to know what to do, look at what 90 percent are doing and then do the opposite of that. What do 90 percent of your friends and family do? Are they in the top 10 percent? If they're not, maybe we stop looking to them for advice on how to get into the top 10 percent. If you want to be a millionaire, do you know anybody who's a millionaire? If not, eh, better ask somebody. Better go find yourself one of those people because they're going to do very, they're going to act very differently. They're going to treat life very differently. Their view on the world and how it works and what's important is significantly different than a guy who makes 50 grand a year. Okay. We're talking about money, but this can translate into anything. If you want to be really fit, you want that six pack when you go to the beach, I'm going to tell you right now. Looking at your fat uncle for advice. You know how many fat people give each other advice on how to lose weight? <laughs> so funny. It's one of the funniest things I, I see is when I you're sitting in a group of, a group with people and you got, you know, like half of them are overweight and they're all talking about what foods to eat and how to diet. I'm like, are you guys for real? Like every one of you is at least 60 pounds overweight and you're giving advice on how to lose weight? No. Why do you listen to those people? Go find some dude in the gym. You know what he's going to tell you? Well, if you want to look like this, it's going to take you four hours a day in the gym and you're going to have to eat food on a regular schedule and diet in a way that would make most people miserable. And if you do that for the next 12 to 18 months, then you can look like this. People don't want to hear that though, do they? It's like we talked about at the top of the show. People want to be told what they want to hear. So we sell them on a pipe dream. Same thing's true when it comes to our economic situation today. What people want to hear is that there are evil corporations out there that are stealing from their workers who are not paying them what they're worth just so they can line their own pockets. That we need to return power to the people. Of course, your answer for this is to make government bigger. Okay? Just make it bigger. Just give power to the very institution that's created the wealth gap and has created the massive, uh, uh, you know, corporatist world that we now live in. That's created the crony capitalism that we see in America today. Just give them more power. It's not the answer, folks. And the fact is, the answer today is for you to get out there and work your butt off for as long as it takes to become part of that 10%. What would, it, what would it mean? Let me ask you, how much, if you guys don't mind, I know most of you are using fake names anyway on, uh, on, on, on YouTube. Just throw out, what do you guys earn in a year? You know, just come up with a number. I just, I'm interested in, in what it is. Because most people are going to earn, the median income in America is somewhere around $52,000 a year. So let's say, you, don't, don't answer that question. It's not important. Let's say you make 80 grand a year. Okay? Say you make $80,000 a year. After the government takes its you know, 30%, because if you're making it working for somebody else, that's what they're probably going to rob from you. By the time you pay all your taxes, about 30% of it's going to be eaten up in taxes. What does that end up being? 80 minus 30% is what? Uh, 60,000 bucks. Is that right, Matt? What was that? 60,000 bucks. Is that what's, what's 63,000 is the median income. 63,000. Okay. Yeah. So if you made 80 grand a year and you 30% of it went to taxes, what does that leave us with? 50,000. Uh, what is it? 50. 50. Okay. Now you got $50,000 of disposable income. Okay. What have we jumped to say 200 grand a year? What do we doubled it? Say we double, we were able to double our income. We went from, you know, 80 grand to 160 a year. Now we're in that top 10%. Same 30% comes off the top, which is what, Matt? Take our 160 minus 30%. 160 minus 30% would be about 110, 115. 110. Left. So 
Yesterday, you made 50 grand after taxes. Now you're making 110. What would an extra $50,000, $60,000 a year do for you? 60,000 of disposable income. How would that change your life? How would an extra $20,000 a year change your life? What if we couldn't even, what if we couldn't double it? What if we couldn't get all the way there, but instead of making 80, we could make 120 or 100? We just throw on an extra $20,000 in income. How would that change your life? What would you be able to do today that you couldn't do yesterday? What would you do with that money? You see, the goal is not millions and millions and millions and millions for most people. For most people, it's about total autonomy. Total autonomy. What does it mean? It means I control. I decide who I want to be with, where I want to be, when I want to be there, uh, and I get to decide what I do. And I don't have to consider the cost. That's what autonomy is. Okay? Every one of you should be striving for that. Because total autonomy means total freedom. To control yourself and your destiny. Okay? So if you guys want help with this, I am still teaching my Knowledge Revolution program. At the end of this, you'll hear an ad for it, but if you just go to controlthesource.com, you can pick it up right now. We've had such a huge response, such great success with it, that I'm extending it, and I'm going to be updating it, and I'm going to be improving it as we go along. Because I think that it is one of the best businesses in the world to be in, the knowledge business. And so if you guys would like to go there, you can go to Control the Source and check it out. If you don't want my help, if, if coming here, if you confuse activity with accomplishment and coming here and listening to the show and nodding your head as you having done something, okay, I'd love you guys listening. Please don't stop. But your life's not going to change until you take some action, until you actually do something. And if you don't like what I got, go find somebody's stuff that you do like and start learning a new skill or start applying it. Start applying it. Start making that dream come true. Ask yourself, who does the person that I want to be, who does he look like? How does he act? How does he think? And then act as if. It's the number one way to get what you want. Become the person worthy of the life you want to lead. Okay? Matt, anything else? I've been sitting here this entire show just writing down your one-liners, your quotes, because uh-huh. you've been cranking them out in this <laughs> in this episode. I mean, lie to yourself until it's true. Be grateful. It changes your whole mindset. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That one you said was not necessarily an original. But uh, if you're spending your life blaming other people for the life you have, you'll never have the life you want. If you want to get out of the situation you're in now, make different choices. Yeah, and then the other one you had from the other day was, you can't stay who you are and expect to have a different life. Yeah. If you want, if you want to hear these quotes, like if you're listening to him while Jason's talking and he's just rattling them off and you're driving or something, you can't write them down, follow him on, on Twitter. I've been going and, and posting some of these quotes on his Twitter while we're talking just so it saves the, saves the clip for later. And look guys, it's either a platitude. I mean, it's just, it's just words that, uh, you know, that a lot of people say, I'm not, I'm not super motivating, motivational that way. I, I don't work like that. I'm very much more of like the drill sergeant kind of approach. And that's just, that's my personality. I grew up in the Marines and, uh, and that was kind of my start to adulthood. And so that's kind of the way I think and the way my mind works. I don't, if you Marines just don't tolerate failure, um, and they don't tolerate excuses. It's a beautiful thing about being a Marine is that you don't get to do that stuff anymore is that people will call you on your shiitake and they will do it publicly in front of everybody. Okay? They don't care if you get your feelings hurt. Oh, you want to cry? Why don't you go sleep? No, I'm not kidding you. This, this has been said before. Oh, you want to cry? Oh, why don't you go slit your wrists? Go back to the barracks and slit your wrists because you're <laughs> worthless. You're worthless. Yeah, As you we get, know, Marines you're going to get everybody people. here killed. So why don't you go kill yourself now? That stuff gets said all the time. <laughs> you want to talk about rhino skin. You think uh, me calling you on your stuff is bad. Dude, yeah. I've been, I have not yet begun to fight. I have not yet <laughs> begun to tear you down so I can build you into the man that you're supposed to be. 
Like that's the, that's the way the Marine Corps works. And so I'm not, I, I think that a lot of times I think we look at those and we're just like, ah, those just, you know, always oh, one of those motivational guys. That's not my intention. But at the same time, somebody in our life has to say those things to us. Somebody in our life has to tell us, has to stop telling us what's impossible and start talking about what's possible. Because there are no shortage of, this, in, of people in this life who will try and keep you mediocre. They'll try and keep you down. Some of them love you very much. But out of care and concern for your emotional well-being, or more importantly, the fact that your success would shine a light on their failure and their mediocrity, they choose to keep you down. They choose to hold you back. Always done with the best of intentions. Can't let that happen. There's got to be somebody in your life that shows up and who always is in support of you. Failure, success, whatever it is. They're always there telling you, you can be better than you are today. You are destined for something greater than the life you now have. You should be creating more impact than you are. And I can't wait for the day that I see that happen. Keep going. Don't stop. Yes, I know you failed three times already. Let's try again. That's what happens. Everybody does it. We've all been there. You are not different. Just keep going. Okay? Just keep going, guys. And if you want help, I can help you. If not, that's fine too. Just come back here and listen. Be here Wednesday and Friday again. Until then, guys, be safe. Be good. I'll talk to you then. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor. Subscribe and then share it with a friend. And if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life, income, and future, then I'd like to help. Just go to controlthesource.com to get started.